in a much more fun way, I am now going to welcome to the stage uh, a, person I, a person I mentioned who you may have seen in the program, Lucy Walker, who is an incredibly talented, award-winning documentary filmmaker. Um, Lucy has won Emmys, been twice nominated for the Academy Award, and made all sorts of documentaries that we will talk about. Uh, I could read you off a list, but I will let her work speak to this itself. Here's a reel of her work. I live in the now. Point to your elbow. Elbow? Yeah, just your elbow. This one? <laughs> There's something happening here. But what it is ain't exactly clear. There's a man with a gun over there. Telling me I got to beware. I think it's time we stop, children. What's that sound? Everybody, look what's going down. There's battle lines being drawn. And nobody's right if everybody's wrong. Young people speak in their minds Are getting so much resistance From behind Every time we stop Hey, what's that sound? Everybody look what's going down What I just a field day yeah. for the heat and people in the street singing songs and they carry inside mostly say they for our side it's time we stop hey what's that sound everybody look what's going down stop hey what's that sound everybody look what's going you better stop now what's that sound everybody look what's going Sit here. Do you want to sit Thanks. there? How are you? Thank you. We're sitting there. My picture. Uh, I think they got it. They get it. Yeah. It's not confusing. <laughs> Hello. How are you? I'm so happy to be here. This is so cool. Thank you for joining us. Um, I have a lot to dive into, and I guess we'll do this in the traditional format of having yeah. a conversation and then yeah. Q&A. I would love it if somebody raises their hand and shuts me up with a question and asks a better question off a thread of something Lucy is talking about. So uh, it's a small enough room. You can seriously just shout out loud. I'm going to kick things off. And, and Lucy, it's so easy for me to slip into um, a conversation about filmmaking, literally yeah. getting in the weeds about filmmaking. And I just want to make sure for, for all of us, we should talk about a lot of that, but, but tying it together with what we're here and exploring is chasing the big ideas. I yeah. love the ending of this. That's so beautiful. And I hadn't seen it till you sent your reel of mm. that exact clip saying there's so many opportunities. And that's a bit of what I was just trying, yeah. trying to talk about is, exactly. is when to know you're on the right road, when to know you're not on the right road, but, but how to chase this idea, we sit around and we talk about the return of the big idea. Yeah. As an incredibly talented, award-winning filmmaker, how do you come at ideas? Do you think about them in that way? Like, oh, it's oh, gotta be a big idea, it's gotta be a, does it just, where does it start for you on each one of these different product, projects? Um, well, I think it's exactly what you're saying and I think your theme really chimes with um, whenever my career has worked best, um, which is, um, you know, as a content creator, I, I trust the quality of what I'm doing. And I think if 
I'm making something that I want to watch, if I'm pursuing something that I'm interested in, if I'm going to a place that I really want to go, but actually it's really hard to get to for some reason, maybe it's um, very daunting or very difficult to access, um, then my being able to get in there will be interesting to other people. So you're always trying to sort of give people something they actually kind of want um, because it's what you want. So it's this kind of N of one. So I've, I've learned that um, uh, really trusting my own gut. There are so many times I think when I think I'm sort of noodling around and indulging my weird own interest and um, you think at the time, like, is this a little bit of a waste of time because I'm supposed to be doing that other thing? And in retrospect, all the greatest things I've done have come from that conversation I had because I wanted to, um, including kind of at, um, you know, at a conference. I've had so many of my films that have started at conferences with idle conversations that were not the ones I kind of was thinking I was trying to get somewhere with, but just sprang out of a sort of curiosity or a shared passion or a shared moment or a shared observation. Um, and sometimes, or even if they were kind of talking initially about one project that we thought we should be talking about, when it devolved to what we're actually interested in, um, or I did a project about cherry blossoms, which was something I just thought that I was interested in cherry blossoms growing up, because they were fun to photograph and um, beautiful, and England, I grew up in England, and the winters are so dreary, but suddenly, with the cherry blossom, it all springs into life, and they're so spectacular, and when I learned photography, we were told to go out there and take photographs, and I happened to take photographs of cherry blossom. I didn't realize that I was not very, very original in this. Um, uh, I grew up in the days without Instagram. And so uh, then later I went to Japan in the middle of the winter, and there was no cherry blossom, but I noticed there was all this sort of postcards and paraphernalia about cherry blossom obsession for a different season, and I started to understand about the cherry blossom. I was not alone in my cherry blossom enthusiasm. There was a whole country of cherry blossom fanatics. And I made a note to, to kind of go back there later and, and realize that that love of cherry blossom in Japanese culture had actually really propagated around the world. When I went to Washington, D.C., mm -hmm. I saw the cherry blossoms one year, and at the time I was grieving my parents and very um, in a really sorrowful place, and the cherry blossoms really spoke to me in that moment um, and sort of gave me new life and was such a symbol of the beauty and fragility. They just really sort of sang to me or something. And, and so it was just, it was, it was sort of that, and at the, but at the time you think, this is just me and my weird cherry blossom interest. You know, you never think like, this is my next Academy Award nomination, this is my Sundance winning, beautiful life experience that's gonna get me a medal in Japan and you know, all kinds of wonderful honors. But really at the time, uh, you think I should be doing that other thing I'm supposed to be doing right now. You don't think, oh, here I go indulging my passions. But I think it is because that, um, that we're in the incredibly luxurious position in our industry of um, trying to talk to people, right, about what matters, about what's beautiful, about how we're, life is experienced for us right now. Um, and that's something that we're going through ourselves. So tuning in more to that is a beautiful thing. And then on a sort of separate track, I also had the privilege of researching very heavily for a project that's not yet out, and um, th there's been a kind of few delays, and it may be far away from being out, but it's the most fascinating project I've ever worked on, which was about creativity. And so I kind of studied the, you know, and, and uh, was, was able to glean from the world's foremost experts in the field of creativity, which is a thing I had not been aware of, and really learn actually about, I could tell you all about the neuroscience of how the ideas happen, and, and the different ways, um, you know, that we uh, sort of arrive at these creative projects. Um, and actually science sort of backs this up as well, that you're sort of, in order to land a, a big creative idea, you need to be as divergent as possible, you need to be um, as far reaching as possible. As in the, it's a wonderful argument, creativity, for, for diversity, actually, mm -hmm. because your own, you each have a set of keys you know, to individual locks of your very own experience and all the different things that you might be passionate about, whether it's, you know, you might be uh, into cars and Indian food or some, some weird combination. Only you has that unique sort of combo to the, and it, sort of big ideas and, and great innovations and great 
um, creative ideas, whether they're technolog technological breakthroughs or incredible um, dinner parties or beautiful pieces of award-winning um, media, you know, they, they are all novel, right, but fantastic. Mm -hmm. And to get that novelty, you have to have some novelty. So you have to come up with something that nobody else has come up with that's unique, um, that only you could have come up with. But you also need to be organized um, and experienced and skilled enough to land that idea. So you also need to be, sort of have that stuff um, locked in. But to have that big idea, you really need to sort of embrace the true um, originality of you and kind of tune into the fact that I happen to be a, someone who loves photographing cherry blossom and who's really sort of personally, um, truly fascinated. So, so that story continues that I decided, I was um, invited to give a, a presentation in my film about nuclear weapons was gonna be released in Japan and nuclear weapons are a very heavy, very, um, very important, very um, terribly sensitive matter in Japan because the two uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima bombs were, were there and it's a big history to contend with. And so I, I didn't want to turn down the invitation, but I had, that film was difficult to talk about, very technical, tested my physics, and, um, and you know, it's, it's a big thing, a film about nuclear weapons. Um, and uh, it had actually been released a year earlier in the rest of the world, so I was kind of like, oh my goodness, can I stop talking about nuclear weapons yet? It was really, um, it was a really, big thing to do, but I, I must say it's not the most fun uh, set of conversations you can have as a filmmaker promoting a film. But I thought, my gosh, I really want to go to Japan and to cheer myself up, I thought, ah, I can organize a sort of personal trip to shoot the cherry blossoms when I'm there. And then I thought, ah, and I could shoot a little film with it. And we parted with an amazing Kira, who is an amazing producer that is how we connected. Mm -hmm. And um, I said, hey, maybe you can help me and we can make a proper beautiful little film about Cherry Blossom because I've never seen a film that really, I'm a filmmaker now, I used to take photographs, stills, but how fantastic. And then we planned to do that and I was very excited. Um, and I was uh, going to uh, Japan on March 16th. At March 11th, I was on a, a conference call with the people in Tokyo who were gonna release the film and um, there was some strange commotion on the line and the publicist, um, who I guess was online at the time, said, oh my gosh, no wonder you've gone quiet. I'm just reading the wire. There's a terrible earthquake in Tokyo. And there was this like strange noise and delay at the end of the line and the people in Tokyo said, yes, uh, I'm not sure should we continue the conference call? There is a bad earthquake. And he said, you know what, let's, you deal with that, we'll reconvene. So then you start reading the newspapers and you realize it was a really bad earthquake. In fact, it was a massive nationwide tragedy and that wasn't even, you know, that wasn't, Tokyo wasn't even the epicenter. And then the news starts to slowly trickle in about the tsunami, the radiation. And I'm supposed to be going to Japan a few days later to present my film about nuclear weapons in the middle of a nationwide nuclear meltdown panic. Tokyo is emptying with people fleeing, the stores are empty of, I mean, it's a big emergency, terribly sad situation. And of course, I'm thinking I can't go to Japan in the middle of a terrible nuclear emergency. And then they canceled the release of my film because they didn't want to spread panic. And, but then I thought, you know what, this is what the subject of the film is about with fragility of life and my connection with Japanese culture. And maybe now is a good time to tell our friends in Japan that we love them, and I'm, I'm curious, wow, what is the J Japanese cherry season gonna be like this year um, when everyone is so reminded and grieving? And I remembered that moment where I'd been grieving. So I decided to go anyway, make a film anyway, and that film became a film called The Tsunami and the Cherry Blossom. So it's a kind of funny example of how only the, that series of events, only my weird personal experience. Um, another fantastic example, um, and I know we're not all big scientists, but I think it helps to, um, you know, um, is, uh, uh, I'm gonna totally fluff this, right? But I'm, go I'm gonna get confused between Pasteur and Fleming, but it's Fleming, right? Fleming is the guy who discovered antibiotics, is that right? I'm gonna fluff this story, but, um, uh, who was the guy who dropped 
the drop on the Petri dish and discovered um, penicillin. That's Fleming. Pasteur. Pasteur, okay. Okay, totally confused. Pasteur, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So that guy, so I always heard that story that he dropped a thing on the Petri dish, which is a scientific little thing, and he noticed that um, it killed a mold, and thence we have penicillin and antibiotics, and human life has been how much better since we invented antibiotics? Thank you so much. What a moment. And that's the story I heard, and I kind of, in my mind, he was a science guy, so of course he had loads of Petri dishes around, and he was trying loads of different things. But the story, when you get a little deeper, gets, for me, much more interesting, which is the funny thing about that guy, who I think is either Pastor or Fleming, turns out it's Pastor, right? That guy, he had a weird hobby. His strange passion was um, making drawings in Petri dishes out of mold. Weirdo, right? And you start to realize that a lot of creative people have their foibles or their strange cherry blossom, you know, interests or whatnot. And um, so he used to actually really like to make portraits out of mold in the Petri dishes. Because I guess back then they had daguerreotype <laughs> circular portraits and it looked a little bit like a round Petri dish. So he tried to sort of create molds that sort of look like people. And he was particularly apparently trying to create a portrait of a queen in two colors of mold. He was, that was his like object, was two colors of mold to really create a kind of, I guess, relief portrait or something. And so he was really had a bizarrely, you know, level of passion and observational experience with mold in Petri dishes, more than your average person for whom they were probably a bit of a pain and like, oops, that experiment got a bit moldy, right? So when he noticed that, he instantly thought, oh, okay, that's a great new thing I can make my portraits with, but he also really twigged, wait, that's a unique thing that I haven't seen before because he'd been paying so much attention, because he had personally that thing. So I love that because of his kind of love of this strange personal thing, he came up with something that's so clearly such a world-changing innovation, such a big idea that has sort of changed humanity. And I think it's just a great example of how sort of doing what you love, pursuing what you love, mm -hmm. talking to people you love, creating stuff you love, um, is actually a fantastic way, not just to create stuff you love and be with people you love, um, but also to actually make best use of our human brains, which is the things that we love, we're naturally really good at, interested in, probably capable of spotting really wonderful novel opportunities in, because of, we can't help ourselves because we've looked at that stuff a lot with a lot of love and attention to detail. Um, so I think it's a great argument to support that old secret that, you know, what should you do with life will do what you love is never a bad strategy, right? Mm -hmm. And here we are, I think, very fortunate to have careers in things that we really love, um, you know, give or take the odd, you know, annoyance that's human existence. Um, so I think that's, that's, for me, the big secret is um, I just do stuff I love. And <laughs> it's working out, I guess. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, right? But yeah. I think that that's a lot of what I talk about, is there's this fear to that, and what if I love it, but it doesn't connect? So there's so much of what you said that yeah. resonates with me of, and for us in the audience, I think of the two words I wrote down were what matters. And I think we're yeah. catching up to now, especially with the explosion of content on all of its various forms, you said something early that I'm gonna totally mess up what you, your, the direct quote, but it was to the point of, knowing the things that you're interested in, mm. but also understanding and making sure that it, they're connecting to what an audience is interested yeah. in. And I think that's what, from my perspective, in my role, what I constantly chase now, the way I put it boringly in the marketing world is, if you believe in the old world where it used to be, I'm gonna tell you what to think and you have no conversation, and then we had a two-way conversation where I can say something and you get a response. I actually feel now we are fully in the space of what is the incredible conversation you are having and how can I contribute to that in a meaningful way that makes sense to your conversation for what you want to do. I actually don't have a role in there. Now, selfishly, I do if I can insert what I believe in, but when you say what matters, and, and when you talk about Tsunami, my favorite film, just because I watch it with my family and my son Spike's seen it like eight times, is The Crash Reel. Mm. But what I love about that story, and maybe it's completely incorrect, is that it was a story that you began to chase because of what happened to Kevin. Mm and his brain injury, 
but like Tsunami, as you were making the film, mm. the world and culture changed in that conversation. Mm. The film became about something else. So mm. I'll try to encapsulate this. Talk to me about that ability to be pursuing a film about a singular person who got injured and had brain damage and understanding how to see what matters, yeah. why it culturally resonates, and how to change the conversation so that it has a bigger impact. Does mm. that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So much in there, which is sort of everything I know. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but a few things. Um, I think one thing is how I can kind of keep going with something, and sometimes they really change course along the way, and sometimes they don't really. Um, is that I guess what drives me is sometimes the question rather than, I don't know the answer often, but I know I love the question so much to drop everything to find out. Mm. And so I didn't know with Kevin what was gonna happen to him. And I didn't know when he had his accident, was he gonna, he wanted to get back on his snowboard and win the next Olympics, having been in a coma for the Olympics he was training for. Um, and uh, you thought, well, looking at him after his accident when he was having trouble remembering his own name and he kept reintroducing himself to people that he knew, um, you don't think that's possible. It seems absolutely outlandish. But then you also know that he couldn't um, lift his arm or speak his own name uh, a couple of months earlier. And so you can see the progress he's making and I'm learning about brain injuries and you're thinking, well, could this be the movie? Like in the Rocky version, he'd, he'd be on the podium for the next Olympics, sure. Um, but also, uh, I, I, you know, I wanted to think that, but I also didn't know what was possible. And I didn't think that was possible, but I just wasn't sure how it could all play out. And at the, the, the terrible other extreme was his terrible anxiety because his brother who was with him was telling me that the doctors had all told the family and been trying to tell Kevin that if he had a, another accident, his head was so um, broken by that first injury that he um, could die with a very slight impact that would, wouldn't even give us a concussion. You think, my gosh, is he gonna be on the Olympic podium? Is he gonna die? Or is something else, you know, between that whole spectrum of, of outcomes possible? And I, I had no idea, but I knew that I cared about him so much, and I was so curious because I couldn't figure it out that it was worth pursuing. So I think that curiosity, again, for me is such a driver. Um, and then on the other hand, I think that's exactly right, how to connect. I'm actually, on the other hand, a total, I also bring my curiosity to how the audience is reading things, what, um, what they're actually getting off a screen, what they're hearing. So, you have to, you know, extend my curiosity. I think you're getting me to think about this in an interesting way, but I've always been a real stickler for testing things on an audience and not, mm. it's great. I, I want to do things because I'm interested and I'm lucky that um, what I'm interested in has always um, thus far touching the wood, um, made its money back done you know, well, everyone involved was happy with my contribution, which is obviously how I keep going because it's um, not my money that makes the films usually. Um, and, um, or anything, uh, you know, that's the nature of our collaborative business, right? Is I have to deliver and make everyone, my collaborators happy. Um, so I've been lucky to do that, but I think the, the reason um, is because, and that, that, that I can kind of exist in that sort of sweet spot of the Venn diagram of doing what you love that's, making everyone else happy enough to let you keep going, is that I am uh, a maniac for connecting it with the audience. Mm. And I'll screen everything with an audience and, and then ask them a whole lot of, like deliberately um, trying to provoke negative feedback and really not taking anything for granted. One thing that you really learn in nonfiction, especially, although I also sometimes direct scripted stuff with mm. actors, but especially in nonfiction when you're not um, uh, you know, you're dealing with real life and people get haircuts or gain weight or change clothes or two years have gone by. You can't even guarantee that someone's gonna really recognize that it's the same guy. And also sometimes people have brothers or another guy with blonde hair. Like, it's just, 
don't take anything for granted in terms of what people are understanding, you know, and being very aware of the fragile um, nature of human attention. My first job, which was fantastic, actually my very first job was um, uh, copywriting, which was really amazing training. Um, I was a um, English language copywriter in Thailand, which was great on many, le many levels. Um, but my first job out of film school, and I realized then that I was just interested in all the um, film and video and went to film school. Um, but then my first job out of film school was amazing, was directing Nickelodeon's Blues Clues. I love that. Which might I date me that. in case any of you out there watched <laughs> it growing up, or maybe you had kids that did. But no, it's amazing. Which episodes? So we can all like I YouTube and see, break down here. <laughs> I, I like to think just watch the episode, and if you thought it was really good, look for the name at the end. Because um, I, did, I did like... 20 of them, I think. I did a lot of them, which was amazing, amazing training. Um, and again, like nothing like directing a show like that, which was very sort of like doing gymnastics because you've got the live action and the animation. The poor guys, by the way, that it's not easy acting with a lot of blue screen and yeah. little pepper pots, you know? Um, and it was really gymnastic um, acting and, um, and at the time very technically innovative and interesting stunt stuff. Um, but what was really fun, and, and I think Malcolm Gladwell actually writes about in his book, um, Tipping Point, was it was a, it, it was a novel um, process in making that show, which is that they really, the creators really wanted it to be, um, you know, really different and effective in how it educated people. The creators really came from a place where if kids are going to be in front of a screen, mm -hmm. how can we change it from a passive experience and try something a little different? So they had this format, for those of you who hadn't seen the show, where, where the host or the actor would ask questions of the audience, and the audience would shout out the answer, and they, we were targeted for three, four, five-year-olds, although we statistics showed us that we had a lot of um, moms, dads, and stoned college kids were some <laughs> of our other audiences. Um, but we, 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 we targeted for three, four, and five-year-olds. We optimized our question and answers. We wanted yeah. the three-year-olds to get it maybe on the last time, last day they watched it, and it was screened Monday through, uh, Monday through Friday, or maybe the last time through. Um, we wanted the five-year-olds to sort of get it the, the, you know, by the second or third time they heard the question. So you kind of really had a sweet spot you were aiming for. And what was really good was the, we had a whole research team, and Malcolm Gladwell detailed it very well, where you um, tested the episode out at all the different stages of production, and we had, because of the nature of the animation meets live action, we had you know, really um, sketches, storyboards, revised storyboards, scripted storyboards, animatic storyboards, uh, rough animatic video in, not, you know what I mean? We just, we had like eight steps or something like that where they went out and tested it on three-year-olds, four-year-olds, and five-year-olds, and you could tweak it until it fell within exactly that, like, 34% of five-year-olds were getting on the third shout-out or whatnot. And you really learned, because we got, as directors, we had all this data. Um, so you could really learn, well, if the bird over there sings right then, all the kids miss it. Like, it doesn't matter. Are we talking about the same thing? Yeah. No, it's just it all connects. Yeah, like, yeah. When we talk this way, this is what we've been talking about over the last day with data yeah. and programmatic and how yeah. does it influence what you're doing. And I love, I did not expect to talk about Blue's Clues. That's not the one that people kind of bring no. out and say talk about. No. But it's so fascinating. My agents are always like, don't, don't mention talk. you did that. <laughs> but the idea That's that cool. you, can, you can have a purpose is kind of what I was trying to get at. Yeah, yeah. You did so much better. Your purpose can be to do education and to educate your yeah, audience yeah. in a better way. That's such a lofty, incredible thing to be yeah. aiming for. But you're using data and you're using the insights and you're using everything you get in to, to feed that purpose. They're, exactly. not, they're not exclusive, right? No, it's amazing. And we have these unbelievable feedback uh, you know, inf information. So, okay, now. so I'm going to take this selfishly to Go a place for, that no, we talk about down. a lot, which is like, is that just, colla is that just setting up a process where you know from the get-go, you talk about what your purpose is going to be, and you know you have time and a feedback loop to put those things back into the creative mm. development. Because I think what we suffer yeah. with a lot, and maybe we all do it creatively across a lot of different um, silos, is mm. if you split out the programmatic and the data, or the insights and the pieces, and it's not connected to the creative, and it's not feeding back that loop, then it's never going to work. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you had, in that situation, it was part of the process. Yeah, exactly. It was a really... You do, and actually, the same thing in film industry. You learn that a lot of um, when films aren't 
terrible. <laughs> it's because the process is mm -hmm. supporting kind of the nose to tail. You know, the whole the whole process is very um, preserving of the of the quality of the creative throughout. I always think of it the example of Pixar as well. Like, why do Pixar have you know such a high rate of hit movies mm -hmm. compared to other studios and um, I think it's because they're really thoughtful about how they protect their process, and this is pretty obvious, right? But um, and they're brutally honest with where things yeah. are heading at every stage. And in the slide about the path, they they guess what might be a dead yeah. end, and then they refigure. And it's funny yeah. you and also, you, but they also anticipate the moment where everyone yes they, they they anticipate the moment where everyone loses confidence. Well, they and ask wants the right to fire questions. everybody right, and they sort of just build that in. They're like, okay, this is the moment yeah. where we want to fire everybody, and everyone gets really depressed. But we've got a plan for this moment. Oh, yes, let's do that. So, yeah, exactly. It's funny, you said it a minute ago, and it reminded me of, I just read an article last week. There's yeah. a comedian, he's getting much bigger, Mike Birbiglia, and now he finally has a show on Broadway. Mm -hmm. And um, the way he puts it is to, and I'm taking this back to when you say you're willing to have test audiences. You no, welcome I love them, them, yeah. But I think you have to ask the questions the right way. So the way Mike exactly. Birbiglia says it is he says, you know, as an artist, I want everybody to love my work. So they come see my play, and I say, did you like it? No, he doesn't say, did you like it? He says, when were you, abo when exactly. were you bored? So my question is, like, when, when were you bored? Not? When yeah. did you hate it? Who did you hate? Which scene should I cut? Right. They're never like, you're my friend. Tell me what was awesome about this. <laughs> because they're never going to, everyone's so polite. You know, never, you know, but you'll find out you know, when people don't go see your movie or the reviews are mediocre or whatever it is. You know, you'll, you'll find out. Better to find out when you're fixable. The one thing that's actually amazing, particularly about nonfiction, which um, is a real privilege, and it, I know it's a little bit harder in different formats, um, is you, it, it is iterative. In a, mm -hmm. And the same thing with Pixar, I think that they've realized that the thing about animation is it's iterative, mm -hmm. and so oftentimes it's much harder to get, you know, um, name your movie star, right? It's much harder to get your movie star back, like week after week to, to try different hand movements or whatever it is, mm -hmm. but when you're animating or when you're Fixing. when you've got really a lot of um, editing time and reshoot time in, in documentary rather than doing one production period, and I think you, so we're often under pressure not to iterate and 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 also under pressure to for the first idea to be the correct one. And again, in nonfiction, I think you have this privilege that sometimes, I mean, actually sometimes my first idea is exactly the movie, my film Wasteland, which is probably my mm -hmm. most awarded film, which I'm very proud of, and nominated for the Academy Award again. And that is pretty much what, I, and everyone asks me, the main question I get about that film is, wow, that must have turned out so different than you expect. And you think, no, no, actually, like, that was the exact idea. And I hadn't even been to Brazil when I had the idea. Like, it's kind of amazing, it's my best idea ever. It was my big idea. and. The only reason I did that entire film was not because what, what in the movie you think might happen, it's because in the movie what actually happened was what the whole idea was, you know? Mm. And I hadn't met the individual people that we were gonna meet who are the joy of the movie and the point of the movie ultimately. So no, I had not met the individuals who work in the garbage dump in Brazil who are the most charming humans ever. But was the film always gonna be about meeting them and discovering who they really were? Yes, you know, was the film always going to be about collaborating with them and trying to do an art project with people that clean up recyclables by hand in a garbage dump? Yes, and then trying to sell the piece and give the money back to them and see what they wanted to do with the money? Yes, you know, so it was always about that whole journey. Um, and um, so sometimes you do know that at the beginning, and other times, like with the Cherry Blossom film, I certainly had no uh, advance warning of the uh, dreadful tsunami earthquake disaster in Japan in 2011 um, uh, at all. And that film was like, I was still shooting the film, and I had just a one amazing DP who wound up with an article in American Cinematography. He's like, wow, the only film I've never had a crew on, and that's the, <laughs> that's the piece in American Cinematographer. And they're like asking him all his questions about his camera and, and yeah. crew and equipment. And he's like, well, what was me and Lucy carrying a backpack? Um, and anyway, we had a translator who was this like arrogant, like kid. Um, 
who was like 20, this uh, lovely translator, but he was just like, what is this film about? And I'd think, oh my gosh, I don't know what we're doing here. It was hard to justify being in a disaster zone at the time. So sometimes you really have no idea what you're, you're doing throughout, you know, and you're questioning yourself at every step. Other times with Wasteland, I had an idea. It was unbelievably mm -hmm. thrilling uh, at every moment to execute it. A little bit terrifying here and there, but um, uh, it's, uh, yeah, so I think sometimes you have greater freedom to revise an idea and your partners are more forgiving of like saying, hey, I was gonna make a film about Cherry Blossom and like Kira, the awesome Kira, was like, wow, it's a little bit different now than when mm -hmm. we had this, <laughs> mm -hmm. when we got our money together and our plan together a week ago to have, you know, you and this amazing DP shoot the Cherry Blossom, the world has changed dramatically. Mm -hmm. But some people will let you ride the challenging um, waves of change and sort of be okay with some of the unknowns that can be very anxiety inducing and other processes. But I think it is, I think it is about trusting your skill. And, and oh, I'm very lucky, I'm actually a very, very well-trained filmmaker as well, which, so there's a lot of skill and expertise yeah. and just sort of hard one, can't short cut that thing. Actually, I'm very sort of, I, yeah, I appreciate that. So, but, I, but that training you can't underestimate as well, I think sometimes. But if you are very trained, it's that old thing about like when you're very, very trained, you can also, harrowing as it is to sort of trust the unknown, sometimes like stay that course through the chops and changes. Mm -hmm. But it is sometimes different processes and, and often more commercial uh, ventures make that very frightening. Like big studio movies, it's very rare that Pixar making films on that budget level can actually really um, not react in terror, you know? Yeah, sure. Uh, I could take it in many ways. We don't have a lot of time left. I want to open it up to any questions that anybody has out here. Does anybody have a question that they'd like to ask Lucy? Yes. Oh, thank you. Thank you. We've seen, um, sorry, whoa, 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 like a major democratization of content creation. Mm -hmm. And you see, and I think especially with nonfiction and with, um, with um, documentaries, you see a lot of people that are using that as a platform. Mm -hmm. Has that changed your approach to how you create your work or how you think to distribute it or that sort of thing, of just kind of seeing the, the success that those types of platforms have yeah. experienced? No, it's really interesting. Again, coming back to that data thing, I think, um, uh, we always heard anecdotally that people would watch, people would so often say to me, I, I saw your documentary online or on TV, mm -hmm. but it's very hard to get data on that. But actually, um, you know, it's, we knew that not many documentaries were getting viewed in big numbers on big screens, but with Netflix and Amazon and platforms having the um, numbers, um, they were seeing which is what we were hearing anecdotally, um, so many people will say, I see your films on Netflix, mm -hmm. I see your films on HBO Go, I see your films on Amazon, et cetera. And, um, and then Netflix sort of started to pay accordingly, you know, and actually there's a whole, there's been a really interesting sort of economic shakeout where there's a lot more money coming in because people are actually watching that stuff. Um, and um, so, in many ways, there's a lot more, there's like been a whole sort of, um, there's been a lot more opportunities and money. That's one sort of thing. Another sort of thing is that um, people are now obsessed with docu-series rather than one-offs because yep. starting with probably the Jinx and then recently Wild Wild Country, but there's a whole new. So I also sort of take it with a grain of salt because not everything is, a series, and sometimes people are pitching me things that really should be great 10 minutes, and you're like, I don't see 10 parts on, you know, um, that moment, you know, whatever, it's just, so I think you have to be, really keep applying first principles, and I always say the perfect length for anything is 15 seconds short of boring, and sometimes short is great, like, I love making short, short films. One of my favorite things I did recently was for Qualcomm and The New Yorker, and it was a five-minute piece about the portrait of um, a swimming, outdoor swimming pool in New York City for a day, which we could also have shown instead of a reel, because I just, and it's 
more recent, that reel's a, a little bit older. Yeah. Some of the more recent work isn't on there, but it's this beautiful portrait. And it was just like a five minute film. And you would not want a 10 part series on the funny people that go swimming in that swimming pool in New York City in the Lower East Side through the course of a summer day. But it's great at five minutes, you know? And uh, so I think that um, there's the length issue. And then I did read something last week that did make me laugh because it rang a bit true. It was like, actually, there's a hollowing out of the middle class on, you know, so there's like a few filmmakers. I'm kind of lucky that I can get stuff commissioned, but there's a few filmmakers that you feel like can just, uh, my friend Morgan Neville, who was struggling forever, and then won with 20 Feet from Stardom, which was not a film that he expected to be his most awarded film. Now it's like, you know, it's like, so some filmmakers are just, because of the way it works, like, you know, their companies, and they didn't actually have a company, it was sort of just them before, have now been commissioned with like 85 pieces, and he's very busy, and it's great. But there's a lot of other people who can't get arrested, you know, at the other end. And, and there's also a big challenge with so much is free, right? So people are starting to think of things as th free. And as any sort of essentially kind of small business, you're like, it's great you watched my film for free by ripping it off. I mean, the, the stats on our Crash Reel film were just like hilarious. You know, how many people have watched it ripped versus paid for it? You know, it's, um, it's, uh, it's a new world out there. I don't know the, I don't know the answer to that. But, um, but people are watching them, and, and we now know that thanks to new data. And this is fantastic news for people like us who, who love making great nonfiction and always felt like people were watching it. But the... Hollywood box office would say, well, you're not Michael Moore, really nobody's watching it. And you'd think, well, that's funny because I can, I can really talk to a lot of people that have seen my film. So I know, and I, it's not that I've met them before, they didn't just, they're not my mom, you know? So, so it's sort of like, it's, that, that's a few of the factors. Is that sort of answering your question? Hmm. Um, about this morning following you about defining brand purpose and cause marketing, which links beautifully to what you've been talking to us about already. And you mentioned your work with the New Yorker and Qualcomm, but yeah. have you considered working with a brand? Do you get approached by brands yeah, to it. help them find their bigger purpose and perhaps link to the work you're doing in a more meaningful way? Yeah, I'm less of a sort of... Um, I'm the one that gets approached when sometimes there's an idea to do something because of that purpose. And I love it. I, um, I love it because um, I'm sort of... Uh, I, when I say I'm purpose-driven, it sounds like I'm, I follow that particular preacher who wrote The pur pur Purpose-Driven Life, which I, which I don't. He's great, and I was asked to do that, a film about that once, and, I didn't, but that's okay. But I think that that, I mean, I think that you can, it's easy to see with my films that I do care profoundly about things. And it's sort of small P political or small C cause. Like I think that you, the, the stuff bubbles up through the story for the most part. The one, the, the one big piece I've done that's more top down cause was I did the film about nuclear weapons was very much associated with a campaign for drawing awareness to nuclear weapons in the world today and the dangers they represented that all these world leaders wanted to sort of me to do. So sometimes you do get kind of cause first. Um, and, um, but I'm, I love that because I feel like, so I, get, I often get approached with, can you make, make this? Mm. And I'm always really candid because sometimes it's the best idea ever. And you, you know, uh, the most effective stuff, right, is when you actually emotionally engage. When you, people, when they watch my films, want to help because they've been moved. That, that's sort of what happens. It's amazing effect. But I didn't sort of, um, if, you know, I, it's, it's through the art and craft of the story and the time well spent. It's the same story making um, and film crafting and emotional, you know, sort of communication, I think, that gets people to that place. It's not, um, I don't, I can't sort of divide it. But I will, I'm the person that often gets approached with projects and I'm very, um, I try to be very uh, candid and say how effective I think I can make a piece. Um, sometimes people come to me and say, you know, they, sometimes people come to me and they think that they've got, you know, a two hour piece or a 90 minute piece that for me is really hard to get people to watch mm. because you can kind of smell the, um, you can kind of smell the cause marketing in it. 
and there's not enough story to actually kind of, as it, it's gonna, that's an airplane, it's a jet plane going down the runway, and it, I cannot, yeah. no amount of skill can get that thing off the ground in the air. You know, I don't have that skill, and I can say to them, like, that person is not interesting enough to, 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 to take you there. You know, you're just, it's never gonna fly as a documentary playing film festivals. Um, sometimes things do, you know. I made a film about soy sauce that has won festivals and people don't think of it as a soy sauce commercial. It's aired on TV, it's won film festivals, and it's a soy sauce commercial, people, but it's not. It's but you're actually, telling it the right way. Yeah, it's a beautiful yeah. film about fermentation and, <laughs> you, you know, but it, it actually right. is. Yes. Uh, but it, what's really funny is, you know, it's, it, what's the difference between a beautiful film about these amazing, this amazing woman who um, ran away in feudal Japan and created this soy sauce empire? You know, what, what, what is the difference, but, and, you know, what is the difference between that and a soy sauce commercial? This one, actually, people really enjoy watching. People write to me, and say, oh my God, I love your film. And, um, and hopefully, and we, we had an amazing time. I think it's, and everyone seemed very happy with it. And, and so there could also have been really bad creative around that that would not have been very watchable. Half an hour soy sauce commercial is highly execution dependent, right? So it was I think that's the back idea. to what you said from the very beginning. It's yeah. what matters in knowing how to connect with an audience and exactly. asking yourself, is this something I would watch? Is, yeah, exactly. Is this an ad or is something I would watch? Exactly. And, and, and the test is, yeah, and my favorite compliment is obviously when people share it and obviously when people, um, my favorite compliment ever was about the crash reel. <laughs> There's a tweet, <laughs> some, some kid said, help, my mom can't stop watching the crash reel. <laughs> just, somehow that just really tickled me because it is, it's sort of, I designed it as really this beautiful emotional experience, right? It's almost like an emotional shower or something of like different colors in the shower or something. It's very emotional and also very, you know, there's a lot of twists and turns and it's very grabby visually and emotionally and musically and there's a lot to love about the film, but I just love the idea that it's like a shower you can't get out of or something. And then my <laughs> mom can't stop watching the crash reel. It's just my favorite compliment. A shower of creativity. Thank you so Amazing. much for joining us here. Such a joy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think off the stage. And the last thing I was going to say is if, you, if anyone has any more questions, I am at Lucy Walker Film, which is designed to be very easy. Um, so nice. feel free to ever, always, anytime, shoot me a further question. And what a joy. Have fun. Thank you so much. Such thank a you. joy. Thank you. Thank you.